words and then introduce our main speaker of tonight. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Comrades, first of all, Sarah Madison. I don't know what Sarah any other languages you have. Absolutely wonderful to be here. I'm seeing people like Peter, sort of about 50 years ago or something, is wonderful. But my very great pleasure is to introduce Keith, well known to all of you. Now, when I became Secretary General of SACA in 1979, partly because the Chinese wanted to expand its the audience for understanding China from just the left to something more general. So they hit upon me to do that. And um, there had already gone up in various universities little ads saying um, a receptionist was needed. And the phone went and I made an appointment and in through the door, you will not believe this some of you, walked this tall, thin, stick insect called Keith Bennett. <laughs> so I give to you the fact that I would never ever survive five minutes without Keith, who was the brains. Whenever things got tricky, he was my best friend. Well, at one stage, for example, when they weren't giving me cake when they had cake, my lovely Keith would keep a piece and sneak it to me and say, don't let them see. So what I had was far more than a receptionist at that time, and a little lesson to people, that somebody with the very, very top academic success was happy to start in a humble way, in a job, as a receptionist. But what I gained was a friend for life. So I give you key. Janet, thank you so much for that characteristically kind, generous, and if I might say amusing introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and comrades and friends, and thank you all um, for inviting me this evening. And it's really a pleasure uh, to see you all. And uh, as much as I was saying, of some old friends, newer friends, but all very good friends, all the people I'm very proud to to have as my friends, thank you. So when Mushtaq asked me if I would do a turn at one of these evenings, I pointed out to him that the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China was coming up, as Janet's told you, I know all the dates. So, uh, and this would make an, important, uh, an appropriate theme for our gathering. And this coming Thursday, July the 1st, marks the Communist Party of China centenary. Now, whatever people's opinions about China, this is an important occasion. This party has a membership of some 92 million people. That's considerably greater than the entire population of the United Kingdom. It leads a country of 1.4 billion people. That country is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, and it's the world's second largest economy. And by some measures, it is already the largest economy. And whether it be international financial crisis, pandemic, climate change, or regional hotspots, the management and solution of global problems today cannot be considered separate from the role of China. So to take this snapshot of where China is today is to reflect on the extraordinary journey this country has undergone since some 13 people representing a little over 50 members, so fewer people in that room than in this room, 13 people met in Shanghai, a city that was then under the control of foreign imperialists, in conditions of great secrecy and danger to found the Communist Party. With a history of some 5,000 years, China is the world's longest continuous and recorded civilization. Its origins go back to roughly the same time as the Indus Valley civilization, which was centered on today's Sindh province in Pakistan. Here, yeah, yeah. yeah. And many of the world's great inventions, such as printing, the compass, gunpowder, which the Chinese used for fireworks and not for military purposes, and countless others originated from China. If one looks at the last 20 centuries of human history, 
China was the largest economy in the world for about 17 of them. The other biggest economy was that of an obviously in those days pre-partitioned India. Together, these civilizations traded with their counterparts as far as Europe along the ancient Silk Routes that in considerable measure prefigure today's Belt and Road Initiative that China has mm. put forward. However, history does not develop in a straight line, but according to a process of uneven development. Western powers, in time followed by Japan, embarked on a process of colonial expansion, dividing the wealth and riches of the world amongst themselves, and on this basis fueling their industrial revolutions. China, in turn, under the rule of feudal dynasties, fell into a period of complacency, stagnation, and then decline. It was ripe for picking by greedy, rapacious imperialist powers. Whilst never completely colonised, China became what's known what it was called, what's been called a semi-colonial, semi-feudal territory country. Bits of territory were snatched away, unequal treaties were imposed. Imperialist powers enjoyed extraterritorial privileges in major cities and elsewhere. The mass of Chinese people endured unimaginable misery. When mm. I talk about extraterritorial privileges, there was a park, in, a famous park in Shanghai, where there was where the signs were up: "No dogs or Chinese allowed." Mm. Perhaps most criminally of all, British capitalists, organised, for example, in the East India Company, forced opium onto the Chinese market, leading to terrible problems of addiction for the Chinese and enormous profits for the British. When a patriotic Chinese official called Lin Zizou attempted to stamp out this trade in there, the British response was war, in the name of free trade, of course. Two opium wars resulted in bitter defeats for China, not least the loss of Hong Kong. Those in the Conservative Party, and indeed the Labour Party, who continue to speak of Britain's supposed responsibilities to the people of Hong Kong, should, in my view, do more to reflect on and repent for that shameful history. For the Chinese people, with their long history of civilization, this period is known as the century of humiliation. Chinese patriots and enlightened people searched for a way out through huge peasant revolts, reform movements to bring in a constitutional monarchy, learning from the West and from Japan, and finally, a democratic revolution led by an outstanding figure by the name of Dr. Sun Yat-sen. But all these ended in failure and disappointment. The country remained impoverished. Sorry, the country remained in ruins. The people remained impoverished. World War I and its aftermath offered a further brief ray of hope. China had entered the war on the side of the eventually victorious allies. Organized, organized as the Chinese Labour Corps, because white imperialists did not really trust Chinese working people with guns, tens of thousands of Chinese made a contribution to the Allied victory, enduring huge casualties, terrible conditions, and brutal discipline that might be likened to slavery. When the victorious powers gathered at Versailles, Chinese people expected their sacrifice to be rewarded. They were given some cause. The US President, Woodrow Wilson, talked big about the right of nations to self-determination. However, it was to become clear that in the mouth of Wilson, who was actually an associate of the notorious racist Ku Klux Klan, self-determination was for white people only, and not even all of them, as the Irish and some others could attest. When in 1919, the German concession of Shandong province, that's in the east of China, rather than being returned to Chinese control, was handed to Japan, the people of China, with youth and students, a number of them influenced by Marxism in the foreground, rose in a great struggle known as the May 4th Movement. It was at this moment that the idea of looking to and following the West died among enlightened Chinese. As Mao Zedong, who was to go on to lead the Chinese Revolution and found the People's Republic of China, memorably put it, people could not understand why the, why the master was always beating the student. <laughs> However, 
Another external event, itself inspired in no small measure by the impact of World War, was also to now make its mark in China. To the north, the Russian Revolution had occurred in 1917, which was to lead to the birth of the Soviet Union and the building of the world's first socialist state. And in stark contrast to the actions of the victorious powers at Versailles, among the very first acts of the new Soviet government in foreign affairs was to reject and repudiate the unequal treaties that the previous Tsarist regime had imposed on China. This had an electric effect on a China that was already in ferment. And it was inspired by the Russian Revolution and with the assistance of the Communist International, which is also known as the Comintern, that had been formed in Moscow, that the Communist Party of China was, as I've already mentioned, formed by just a handful of people. From such tiny and modest beginnings, the Chinese Communist Party grew rapidly, especially among the young and extremely militant Chinese working class. The other key factor impelling its growth was the formation, with the advice and assistance of the Comintern, of a united front with the Kuomintang, that's the Nationalist Party, formed by Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who had led the 1911 revolution that had overthrown the Qing dynasty and formed a republic. Also influenced by the October Revolution, Dr. Sun had moved to the left and now advocated alliance with Soviet Russia, cooperation with the Communist Party, and support for the workers and peasants. However, Dr. Sun passed away in 1925, before his 60th birthday, and his successor of the leader of the Kuomintang, Chiang Kai-shek, was a very different person, far more opposed to socialism and the working people than he was to the warlords, who then still controlled much of China, or to imperialism. In 1927, in what became known as the Shanghai Massacre, Chiang unleashed brutal repression on the communists and anyone even remotely suspected of supporting them. Many thousands were killed, the party's survival hung by a thread, its survivors forced to either flee or go deep underground. It was at this point when the party had hit rock bottom that Mao began to properly formulate what I consider his greatest contribution to the science of the liberation of oppressed people, not only in China, but in many other countries too. From a peasant background himself, the young Mao had already distinguished himself, for example, in the very first article in his selected works, which is entitled The Analysis of Classes in Chinese Society, by the importance he attached to the peasantry as the largest class in Chinese society, and in his grasp of its enormous revolutionary potential. Now from here begins the transition from tragedy to triumph, with the formulation of a set of strategies and tactics that embrace the building of stable revolutionary base areas, the organizing, the waging of protracted people's war in the primary form of guerrilla warfare, and surrounding the cities back from the countryside so as to ultimately seize nationwide political power. And this was something completely new in Marxism, which had always hitherto stressed the central role of an urban industrial working class. Another key turning point was World War II. Actually, you can say that World War II began not in Europe, but in Asia, with Japan's invasion of Northeast China in 1931, and then the rest of the country in 1937. Despite the rivers of blood between Chiang Kai-shek and the communists, Mao and his comrades, like Zhou Enlai, saw that it was necessary for all the forces of the nation to join together to fight the Japanese aggression. Very reluctantly, in fact he had to be kidnapped and held prisoner by two of his own generals to secure his compliance, Chiang agreed to the formation of a second united front with the communists. China's resistance, which saw tens of millions of casualties, made, made a major contribution to the Allied victory over fascism. In particular, by tying down millions of Japanese forces, it ensured that the Soviet Union never had to fight on two fronts at once. And the shift to the right in the United States with the death of Roosevelt and the onset of the Cold, of the Cold War. Thus, from 1946, a revolutionary civil war ensued, culminating in a communist victory in 1949. Now, I would cite three main reasons for this victory. 
One, the role played by the communists in the anti-Japanese resistance, which gained them tremendous prestige and support. Two, the hopeless corruption and venality of the Chiang regime, which led to problems like hyperinflation and alienated not only working people, but also intellectuals, national and patriotic capitalists, and other sections of the population. And three, significant levels of support from the USSR. So on the 1st of October 1949, Chairman Mao stood on the rostrum of Tiananmen Square in the heart of Beijing and proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China with the famous words, the Chinese people have stood up. The Chinese people may have stood up, but they had reclaimed a broken nation. Poverty, hunger, disease and illiteracy were rampant. Life expectancy was pitifully low, less than 40 years. China was practically the poorest country in the world. In their way, the years from 1949 have been as momentous and tumultuous for, for China as the years from 1921 to 1949. Less than one year later, China was again at war, as the United States threatened to extend their vicious war in Korea into an invasion of China. At home, a massive program of land reform uprooted feudalism and landlordism, while a state-directed mixed economy, combined with significant aid from the Soviet Union, started to lay the foundations of industrialization and modernization. But it was not all plain sailing. A tendency towards increased and excessive radicalization, combined with a damaging estrangement from the Soviet Union, led to a succession of mass movements culminating in the Cultural Revolution, which broke out in 1966 and lasted in one shape or another until Mao's death in 1976. The Cultural Revolution, whatever its original intentions, ruined lives, inflicted deep wounds on society and retarded economic development. Nevertheless, important achievements were still scored in this period too including China's successful development of the H-bomb in 1967, which obviously enhanced national security in a critical period, and the launch of its first satellite, appropriately playing the revolutionary song The East is Red in 1970. And if we're very lucky, we're going to hear The East is Red from Hugh a bit later. <laughs> now, what, whatever the mistakes China made in this or any other period, it successfully solved the basic problems of providing food, clothing, shelter, education and healthcare, the most essential and fundamental human rights, to nearly a quarter of the world's population. This would have been impossible without the revolution, and it is something that has singularly eluded other large and broadly similar developing countries, such as India, whose social and economic position, whilst not good, was better than China's at the end of the 1940s, in other words, when China had its revolution and India became independent. So following Mao's death, the country's new leaders, with Deng Xiaoping, who Janet met, <laughs> and she, then we'll have to feature that in your talk, uh, with Deng, anyway, with Deng Xiaoping as their foremost representative, summed things up and embarked on a programme that they called Reform and Opening Up. The decades that have followed have seen nothing less than the most remarkable economic transformation in human history. China has lifted nearly a billion people out of poverty, constituting the absolute majority of global poverty reduction. From a negligible actor in the global economy, China has become, as I stated at the start of my talk, the world's second largest economy. China's space program has recently landed on Mars, and also recently became the first country to land on the dark side of the moon. These are among the many and countless achievements of the Chinese Communist Party. And although the things I've just mentioned have occurred in the reform period that began in late 1978, they cannot be separated from the revolutionary struggles waged from 1929 to 49, and from the foundations of a new society built between 1949 to 1978. They are, in other words, achievements of 100 years. And not least, as China constitutes around 22% of humanity, such achievements and transformation cannot but also have a profound impact on the world scale. 
China has become an alternative source of trade and investment for countries around the world, the great mass of developing countries in particular. It is China's great economic strength that has allowed it to launch the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, as an unprecedented program of investment in infrastructure and connectivity with, as I mentioned earlier, its contemporary echoes of the ancient Silk Routes. Now, in the front of the BRI is, of course, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC, a flagship project that reflects the very special friendship between Pakistan and China, whose 70 years of diplomatic relations was marked by both countries less than two months ago. In 2017, I was very fortunate and privileged to visit Islamabad, Karachi, Wada, Quetta, Rawalpindi, and Karot, together with Mushtaq, and to see how CPEC is already transforming the lives of people in Pakistan. And the closeness between the people of the two countries can be, could be seen not only in Pakistani and Chinese workers working side by side, but also by seeing Chinese people wearing shawar, shawar kameez and speaking fluent Urdu. The fact that China is increasingly able to offer an alternative to the whole world is, in my view, a key factor in the, in the dramatic ramping up of hostility to China that we have increasingly seen on the part of the major Western powers. The United States and other major Western powers had two key expectations when they engaged with China in the reform period. One, that China would remain a cheap labor global factory and assembly point, rather than advancing to the front ranks of science and technology, innovation, research and development. Two, that as China became increasingly integrated into the global economy and society, it would give up socialism, give up the leadership of the Communist Party, and adopt some variant of the political and economic system that's prevalent in the West. Now this didn't happen. In fact, China's present leader, Xi Jinping, is clearly determined uh, to make China both more developed and more socialist. Hence, we see a dangerous new Cold War against China. This Cold War, like its predecessor, is, in my view, against the interests of humanity. Global challenges that threaten every person on Earth, such as the current pandemic and the looming threat of climate change, cannot be tackled without the active and constructive input of China. Without China and its growing strength, developing countries such as Pakistan would have very few options. They would, to a great extent, be at the mercy of the colonial imperial and imperialist powers and their international financial institutions. Now, I'd like to ask you to keep this background and this big picture in mind when we come up against the huge lies that are currently being told about Xinjiang. I'd like to ask you to remember and reflect on what the Western powers and their key allies have done to the Muslim world over this last period. How many innocent Muslims have they massacred or starved with sanctions in Iraq, Libya, Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan with their drone strikes, Iran, Lebanon, Palestine, Somalia, Kashmir, and so on. No, and yet the rulers of the United States and Britain, the very people responsible for these atrocities and crimes against humanity, want to pose as the guardian angels of Muslims in China. I think this strains belief, to be honest, and it's no wonder that not a single government of a Muslim-majority nation, despite some undoubtedly serious pressure being placed on them, has taken the West's side against China on this matter. In fact, they nearly all, if not all, if not all, I can't think of one it doesn't apply to, enjoy a great and mutually beneficial friendship with China. So, in conclusion, I'd like to again thank Mushtaq and Third World Solidarity, of which I'm proud to be a founding member for the invitation, to thank you all for coming, and to thank the staff of Mira Masala for the excellent food that has always <laughs> In the course of its history, of course, the Chinese Communist Party has made mistakes. Even a minor human activity cannot be free from error. Leave alone one as enormous as this. I had a comrade in Norway called Trond Bokrin, now sadly passed away, who used to say, 
I've made mistakes in the past and I promise to make them again in the future. <laughs> but the achievements of the Chinese Communist Party are unprecedented and greater than those of any other political party in history, mm. without exception. They have changed the face of China and the world, and this centenary is one worth celebrating. Thank you again, and I look forward to speaking with as many of you as possible during the rest of the evening. Thank you. Uh, can you make note? What about the uh, as like the most Asian society, which are the patriotic society? Uh, what about the Chinese Communist Party? How many women who are on a decision-making role in Chinese Communist Party, and what is their role? And would it be possible in the near future or any uh, in a, in a future if there is any women who would be a general secretary or the chairman of a Chinese Communist Party or not? Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment? Yes. In India, uh, the Muslims in China, there's you can say about 12 million Muslims. And uh, uh, China is being wise being accused to genocide the Muslims. Uh, I, as a Pakistani and a state of Pakistan, I can understand because they are allies from uh, natural allies to the Pakistan as a state country blame. We can raise the voice uh, against India, but they are doing in Kashmir. But uh, we can't uh, raise the voice uh, against uh, China, what they are doing uh, to Muslims in uh, uh, China, because we are friends there, we, are, uh, we believe our friendship. But why they are sentenced, the Muslims in China, from years and decades, uh, and how they can be started out that thing? What, what's your take about, about that thing? since 15th of July 1967 and in Pakistan I am the only, mem only member of one party which is Communist Party Maoist since 1967. I am a member of Labour Party now in the United Kingdom but I have always worked with other progressive people in Communist Party, GB, New Communist Party and others. So I, I declare that. Any other comment? Kamal's last question first, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't know about somebody else will have to answer that bit yeah. about my speaking style. I really don't know. Um, so this question of um, Muslims in China um, and, um, and the situation in Xinjiang, we could talk about it for a long time. And uh, one, you know, we, we don't have that option, at least at this point in the let, let me make a few remarks. I think, first of all, I think, you know, to dissect your own words, you, you put it very well. You talked about that this was propaganda, and you know, that's, you know, that, that, that's what it is. It, it's, um, it, it's said, it's whipped up by people in the West who, um, of course, with, with some, with some, uh, people from the weaker community of China, and I'll, and I'll come to that in a minute. But it, it's worked up by people in the West who are looking for a reason uh, to attack China. And it's, um, it's a bit like the, um, it's a bit like the way that um, the charge of anti-Semitism was used to, to attack and bring down Jeremy Corbyn. That is, what you do is you take the most horrible, outrageous things that you can think of and pin it on that person and make something and accuse them of something that's so evil that to even say, hang on a minute, let's discuss it, then you're accused of, you know, then, then you're accused and considered guilty of, of, of terrible crimes uh, yourself. 
I mean, I think it's interesting that one of the one of the organisations that's been very prominent in this country of accusing China of genocide against Muslims is the Board of Deputies of British Jews. And this is interesting because the Board of Deputies of British Jews were also in the, and this is nothing to do with being against Jewish people, it's about the Board of Deputies specifically. Um, but the Board of Deputies of British Jews was in the forefront of the campaign to bring down Jeremy Corbyn. And, but, but, you know, but there were mosques everywhere and there were people going in and, and, and freely practicing um, their religion. And as I say, he didn't have an official post in China, they were just you know, wan 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 wandering around. Um, there is a, um, a you know, there is a security problem in in Xinjiang, um, and um, you know there there are there are complicated reasons for that. One is that starting from the war in Afghanistan, um, you know, starting from the war in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Some people from Xinjiang, they went to, to fight in, in Afghanistan and, and they fell in with some extremist factions there. And, and they've been also going to, um, people have been going to, um, uh, to fight in, in Syria and, and teaming up with Al-Qaeda Al sponsored elements and, and Islamic State elements and, and, and getting radicalized and coming back. And there were a whole series of um, terrorist incidents in, in, in Xinjiang because, because of this. Um, well, both in Xinjiang itself and in other parts of China, there was a, a case in down in southwest China, really, you know, a couple of thousand miles from Xinjiang, where a group of these people a few years ago ran amok in a railway station waiting room and stabbed about 20, 30 people to death. You know, similar kind of thing to what we saw here in, on, on London Bridge. So you know there, there you know there is there is a pro there is a, a problem there, and they, therefore they they become prey for for you know extremist elements uh, and and so on. And th this is part of the problem. So what in the West they're calling concentration camps and so on. There's a lot of these people are being brought into vocational schools and and are being taught. Yeah, they're they're being taught. You know the national language, Chinese. That doesn't mean to say they can't speak their own language. They still learn their own language as well. But, you know, if you don't, if you learn only the Uyghur language, how are you going to um, function? You know, in, you know, in the world, if you don't also know at least your own national language. I mean, every every school student in China learns English as well. So, you know, so the people are learning the national language. They're learning skills. Uh, and being and, and, and being found jobs. So, you know, I think that you know, in these in this current period of history, if you look, um, you know, what with the level of satellites and, and 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 so on, it's very difficult to hide things. I mean, I read an interesting article a few months ago by on a website called Thirty Eight North. It's an American um, North Korea watching organization. And they had a, you know, to me actually quite interesting article saying that um, um, it has become clear from satellite observation that there are an increasing number of traffic lights in the North Korean capital of Pyongyang. Now, if you can pick out traffic lights, you know, through this kind of satellite surveillance that the US and so on is going everywhere, you think that they can massacre people in, in, in Xinjiang and, and um, when they want to have a huge campaign against it, they can't bring even one single piece of evidence uh, about it. Now, that's not to say, like, as I said, the Chinese Communist Party has made mistakes and human beings make mistakes. As I say, there's, a, there's been a difficult situation there, there's been a problem with extremism, there's a problem with terrorism. And yes, some people in China, because Part of the downside, if you like, of having 5,000 years of civilization is that the majority of people in China, there does exist to some extent a tendency to look down on other people and, and minority nationalities. This is a, a deep-seated problem, which the Communist Party doesn't approve of, but you don't, you don't uproot backward ideas that have existed for thousands of years overnight. Well, one of, one of the strengths of Chinese civilization 
in my view, is that it, it has absorbed things from outside and it, it's made them Chinese. I mean, there were, if you look at the history of China, if you look at the dynasties of China, like the, the, um, the, the Yuan dynasty, that's uh, Kublai Khan from when Marco Polo went to China, they were the, the Mongols. They'd actually invaded China and uh, they'd invaded China and conquered China from Mongolia. Two centuries later, they were the rulers of China, and they were more Chinese than the Chinese. It's similar, the last dynasty in China was the Qing dynasty. They were from the Manchus, a very small national minority in, in the northeast of China. Now, and you know, there's besides the like the Muslim people in in, in um, Xinjiang, there are actually Muslim people throughout China. Uh, there's a, another group of people in China, Muslim people in China, called the Hui. H-U-I. Yeah. They, these are the people, the majority nationality in Chinese are in China or the Han. The Hui people, if you look at them, they look the same as Chinese. And if you, and this language, they just, they just speak Chinese, but they're a separate nationality because they are actually the, um, but they're spread all over China. Some of them, because it was the end of the ancient Silk Route, are in the western province of Gansu, but they're also throughout China, including like the big ports like Shanghai, because they are the descendants of the Arab and Iranian traders who'd come from, from centuries ago to and, and had stayed and they intermarried with the local people and in the end they became just like the rest of the Chinese nation in all respects but one, and that is that they kept their Muslim faith and, and traditions, and they don't eat pork, which is for the rest of the Chinese, it's their favorite meat, but the Hui people don't eat pork. Um, some of them drink alcohol, I have to say. I once had dinner with um, a woman, because I was asked about ladies, about the membership of the Communist Party and women. Now, obviously on paper, on paper, the Chinese Communist Party believes in the equality of, of men and women, and practically the first law that was introduced when the People's Republic was founded was the law on marriage equality, of equality of men and women in marriage. It was the first piece of legislation that the Communist Party brought in when it formed the government. And Chairman Mao had a famous saying, he said, women hold up half the sky. And he also said that whatever men comrades can do, women comrades can also do. But again, just as I was talking about the kind of chauvinist attitude of some Chinese to, to national minorities, Ideas that have been in people's heads for thousands of years don't go away overnight. So it takes a lot of time to, to break down these um, the, these ideas. And um, the, um, so you know the the reality in China, whilst obviously women have secured tremendous gains, but the reality in China is that yes, they don't. Um, enjoy the full equality that they should in reality. In law, yes, but in reality, no. So I, I can't give you the exact figures offhand, but... I'm so pleased and I'm going to say a few words about each of you, if you don't mind, instead of you standing up and introducing, because I know you all. So it is Ali uh, Majid, who is doing uh, training as a pilot. And he's a very actively involved with us. His father is sitting with captain, Navy, and then uh, uh, shipping captain, Majid, who has been a supporter of not only my organization, Third World Solidarity, but my charity, Joker and Project as well. And his son, second son, Abid, who is Abid Majid, who is a journalist. He is a Middle East expert, but he writes a lot on Turkish uh, newspapers. Then Jasmine Ahmed, as I said, one of my very close friend and permanent supporter, Shahid Nadeem. Sundu is a solicitor here in East London, lives in Margaret, but he led by Dr. Mubashar Hassan, Ayy Rahman, these are very well known people on the left of Pakistan. Then Shafi Naki Jami, Jamai is because there is a very famous university college in Karachi, uh, uh, Islami Jamia. He was educated there, that's why he's Jamai, and he worked for BBC for many decades in Urdu, Hindi, and English sections, and you must have seen him on the TV. Barrister Huma Price is a barrister, again, a very old friend of Third World Solidarity, always supported it. At some time in 2005, we re-established when we all were meeting, she used to take our minutes as a secretary. So I'm very pleased. 
Then on my left is uh, Janet Austin, who is going to speak, and she is going to introduce Keith Bennett, who is today's main speaker, Hugh Goodacre, well, when he was working in a library. And he worked with Keith and myself, and he held a meeting uh, under British Commission, which was related to world war crimes. Come on, Majid, come on. A friend has written a book in Turkish on his life and struggle. And he is a uh, Iraqi Kurdish living in England for many, many years. And if I start speaking about him, you would not be able to eat tonight, but you have to sit here for all night. It is a very <laughs> long history. Uh, both of them, basically, the Peter Hawke is another <coughs> colleague of mine. Ishtiaq Human is our media coordinator with Sajjad Bhatt. But if you see these three people here, Ishtiaq Human, Kefale Almo from Ethiopia, he is a doctor in agriculture. You know Ethiopia is going through a lot of challenges nowadays because of Tigrayan and because of Eritrea and we are having a lot of meetings and we have many meetings. He is expert in uh, uh, agriculture, he learned his agriculture expertise in Russia. I, I, I can't even drive, so I was, uh, this morning I had a meeting at 9 o'clock. Then I had a lunch in Buckinghamshire in a form where I was riding a horse after 45 years. <laughs> and I sent some of you that picture, but I'll send others that photograph of horse riding. White, beautiful horse. And that she was a group coordinator of uh, uh, Group 48 Club. Uh, uh, group 48 Club was, which was established in 1953. A 48 British company defied British government ban to do business in China, and that group still exists. Keith is one of the office bearers, but she was one of the founder member and coordinator of it. And also, she was part of uh, SACO, Society of Anglo-English Understanding. I was invited by Jenny Clegg in Manchester to speak on CPEC and Belt Road Initiative a few years back. Red is the sun. China has brought forth a Mao For the people's happiness He works through a hayo Keeps the people's liberator Chairman Mao loves the people Chairman Mao, he is our guide To build a Communist Party is like the sun, bringing light wherever it shines. To where there's a communist party, to where the people win liberation. Where there's a communist party, to where there's the people. Please carry on. You can sing as long as you want. No, I'll just do one more. This uh, this uh, song it comes in the film of the East Israel when the when the Red Army is marching across China uh, towards uh, victory. Enjoyment starts. Because uh, Afshar Begum has joined us.